Concession War Arc. I am caught up for now. We have more chapters coming, which I could not be more grateful for because what a place to leave us off. Uh, but I will be discussing the second half of the chapters that we do currently have. I already have a video about the first half of those chapters. I'll link it somewhere. Uh, but now we'll be talking about the next section. And because the Succession War arc is really big and there's a lot going on and it's a lot of things don't even begin to have payoff at this point. This isn't really going to be a review of this section. Um, instead, what I'm going to do with this video is I will quickly highlight some of my favorite parts of the section that I just read, just some things that I thought were excellent and that I'm excited to see more come from it. Uh, and then we'll talk about my thoughts on this arc overall, as far as we have of this arc overall, and then we'll talk about a couple of theories about how this arc could go. I can't say that I'm a good theorizer, so each section will be relatively condensed. Starting with Kurapika. So his section of chapters, anytime we're following him and him teaching the guards Nen and uh, learning more about his abilities, I genuinely think that his plot line is the least interesting in this arc, which is really funny because boy would I have not expected that going into it. But I do, I think that at least at this point of the story, every time we're in his perspective, it's the least interested I am. But I'm still, I'm still enjoying it quite a bit, especially just because of just seeing Karapika in action. Learning more about his abilities is easily the most interesting thing that's happening around him. Um, but then also just getting a little bit of a peek inside his mind. We already knew that he was an incredibly intelligent character, but seeing him rationalize and reason through everything and every time he gets new information, the way he, um, how he adjusts and pivots according to what the situation needs right now. Seeing him think through everything and plan and strategize and still have his own goals in the back of his mind while also taking on um, the care of the prince that he's in charge of, in charge of protecting. I don't I don't think that his plot line at the moment is very interesting, but I do expect that to change. There's a lot of potential with his plot line. It's just right now, it's it's the one that interests me the least, but being around Karapika and being in his mind is incredibly interesting. And we do get some really, really cool stuff with him, like again, exploring more about what he, what he what his abilities contain, as well as getting reveals in his plot line, like what it was that was sucking the blood out of these corpses that they're finding around. Can't wait to learn more about that. While there are a lot of characters to keep track of between the different princes and their connections with the different uh, guards or mafia groups or whatever, everybody everybody has an agenda. Everybody has a goal. Almost everybody has a goal. Almost everybody has connections outside of just the royal family. Then you also have the guards to keep track of, and then there's Karapika and the spiders and. Hisoka, wherever he may be. It's all so much to keep track of, but one thing that I have loved each time we're hanging out with the prince is to get to know their Nen Beast. I am enjoying so much seeing the different abilities that the princes themselves can have, and then what the their Nen Beast can do as well. And I haven't even learned them all yet, but seeing their designs, some of which are awesome, some of which are horrifying, seeing what they're able to do and how they're protecting, uh, their princes is all, I love it. I love it all. And everything that's going on with the fourth prince, whose name I will not attempt to, <laughs> to uh, pronounce here, uh, everything that's going on with him is one of my favorite plot lines to follow. Just the fact that he's such a prodigy in learning Nen, that he's so intelligent and cunning and ruthless and cutthroat and horrifying, just generally a terrifying human being. And he's also incredibly powerful <laughs> to boot. He's a really interesting player to be following. And then whenever we got the de development of his abilities, whenever we learned that he can change the course of the future, I guess is the best way to simply describe it, how he can 
in a moment, see what's coming 10 seconds ahead, and then choose to react differently to create a new reality. But the person who would have interacted with the old reality sees the old reality, but the new reality is what actually happens, which I just think is really fascinating. Also gives him a massive edge. I mean, I know it's only 10 seconds, but a massive edge. I also find it interesting that his Nen Beast um, confronted the guard and challenged her and threatened her. I'll, what did she say? I'll make you less than human or I'll take away your humanity. Something worse than death is being threatened here. And there's, there's a physical mark of that threat that's being impressed on her. I find it interesting, unless I'm misremembering something, which is very possible. This is a very elaborate and confusing arc. So I can't pretend to know half of it, but unless I'm misremembering, I think this is the first beast to speak to someone, right? This is the first, like pe some people can see the beast, but nobody, no, oh, I'm already wrong. I, I'm already wrong. Ah, that's gonna derail everything I wanted to say because that giant mouse creature that belonged, beast that belonged to the first girl that died, she, he would pop out of the wall and be like, hey, you got a minute? That was hilarious. Never mind, let's move on. He's also very attracted to her all of a sudden. Ever since she revealed, or he realized that she was lying to him and trying to kill him and not to be trusted, I believe the line was something, something like, two-faced women are really attractive or something like that, which, I don't know, this is the guy that we got introduced to him by him bringing women into his room so that he could murder them and then display them as art. Am I remembering that right? So I feel like she's in more danger now than ever before. When she was just his guard and she was just trying to double play him and manipulate him and uh, and set him up to die, which was already very risky and she was nervous. I feel like now she should be a lot more nervous. <laughs> now that he's attracted to her, girl, run. Also, he's interested in Melody different ways, but he did specifically say, after Melody did her flute concert, bring her to me. I don't know what his plans for her are, but please don't touch Melody. I already mentioned, you know, a lot of different players in this, but another another group of people that really interests me is uh, the different assassin groups that are also involved and that are interwoven with the princes. Some of the princes are working with them and how they're connecting into the grand scheme of things, but the assassin group that interests me the most are the ones that are illegitimate ch children, so they've scarred their faces to to show that they can't be heirs to the throne. I find them very fascinating um, and what they're able to do, the chaos that they're able to bring, especially the one girl who uh, basically is like, I don't care about my life. I don't care about this world, kill it all. <laughs> and she has this ability to kiss you, which will then give you a numbers and stats game of if you kill someone, then you get so many points, but if you kill a prince, then you get a higher number of points, which means that she's cool with starting a war between the different mafia groups, with completely disobeying the rules of this concession war and start sniping princes on her own. And the people that are the most able, the strongest, the most willing, the people that rack up enough points, they then are able to distribute, they then get her ability and are able to distribute this ability to other people, building up their own followers, which means that these underdogs have an extraordinary amount of power that could completely tip the scales to where this army is the greatest. And that's actually something that I have been seeing a lot of in the reading of this arc is that there are different characters that, which I'll talk more about some of them in a minute, but there are different characters that have these abilities that cause them, that give them the opportunity to build their own armies, their own legion of followers, which makes this war a lot more exciting to me, even though right now we're in the strategizing and planning and thinking and talking stages, which are very slow moving. 
much like the early stages of the Chimera Ant arc um, is kind of how I see this, the point of the arc that we're at right now. Like, I don't know what it would have been like to uh, read the whole, the entire middle section of Chimera Ant, where they're literally just sitting around and talking and strategizing, and Togashi is building tension in the unknown of how things will go and showing the anxiety that the characters are facing, you know, which reading Chimera Ant all together, was awesome. That section was amazing. And I imagine that's kind of like what this is. Uh, I said week to week as if we're week to week with Hunter Hunter, but we will be soon for a little bit. But I imagine that's what this section of the concession war arc is, where we're in that, that tension building, which I think he's building tension amazingly in this arc, that tension building, very slow, uh, deliberating, thinking, planning, strategizing, trying to figure out what's going on and being introduced to all the different players. You know, Chimera Ant was a wide cast too, not nearly as big as this one, but it was, it was also a lot of new introductions in that arc too. And then the Chimera Ant end ended up being this massive, giant, incredible, satisfying, and horrifying war. And I imagine that we're, we're looking at something really similar with this arc, especially with all the different players and how much power, opportunity for power they have, it, it gives, and it gives a feeling of unknown where I just genuinely, I couldn't guess who's going to win this war. Will it even be a prince? Or will it be this assassin group? Will it be Karapika? I have a low key theory around that. Or is it not even going to be one person or one group of people? Will it there end up being an alliance and the rules of this concession war be broken? I don't know. <laughs> so there's a, there, it, there's, there's a lot of tension here. There's a lot of build up, slow, slow build up happening here. But all this slow build up is creating this really complex web that ends up giving the opportunity to have a very unpredictable and thrilling war, which is what I expect Togashi is building up to. And if Togashi has a strength, fight scenes would be it. And he's already proven that he can balance and can create an incredible epic fight scene. He he does a lot of close combat fight scenes, just 1v1 or just a couple people against a couple people, and he does that extraordinarily, but he proved in Chimera Ant that he can handle an epic war and balance it and make it thrilling and terrifying. And that's what we're doing here with this arc. That's what we're building up to, but even on a bigger scale. And I'm just, I just really think it's gonna be good. I'm supposed to be talking about moments that I've enjoyed and I've, I've switched to talking about the arc as a whole, whoops. Anyway, back to the assassin group. I, it was rude of Tagashi to initiate the assassins on the last chapter before he goes on hiatus. He, he, he activates them. He shows us these two really cool characters, one of which is able to punch the truth out of someone and the other can be cut and his blood seems to have the properties of both rubber and gum. I don't know, these characters that just got activated in this last chapter are also so fascinating and I would like to follow them more. Easily the most interesting piece uh, plot line about this arc though for me is with the Phantom Troops, the Phantom Troop and Hisoka, even though they're not getting a lot of page time at this point, I'm sure that will continue to ramp up. But you know, these are players that I'm very, very invested in and that I just find so fascinating. And seeing them now not toying with each other, not playing a game, not Hisoka messing with them so that he can get a great fight, but actually just going for blood not not playing a game out to kill as well as Crollo who you know when Hisoka killed two of his phantom troop when they were the most vulnerable that activated some high emotion in him we're getting some extreme facial expressions out of him that we didn't get when we've seen him previously and I don't know I just I, that's gonna be really interesting. Um, one of my patrons did tell me about the uh, the theory that's out there about Hisoka being 
the, the Illumi that we're seeing in this particular arc, that he has uh, changed his appearance and he's impersonating him, which I actually kind of dig because I felt like Illumi seemed out of place in this arc anyway. Um, I mean, he gave a reason for why he was here, but it didn't set right with me. And th there have been other clues like him wanting a shower and him divulging information so easily, which is not very assassin-esque of him. And other th other clues like that that make people think that. And I'm totally on board with that theory. And I, it, wh whether that's what it is or not, I'm excited for Hisoka to show his face and see what we're gonna get with them. I do wonder where Leorio is in this arc because he's on the ship, isn't he? I mean, am I misremembering something? He's on the ship, isn't he? Why haven't we even checked in with him once? Where is Leorio in this arc? As for, I'll just really quickly uh, talk about which princes of the lineup interest me most. Obviously the fourth prince that I've already mentioned, who's the genius and the horrifying, terrifying person, the one with the red eyes uh, of, of um, Kurepika's people, Camilla, interests me so much, her attitude, her willingness to just completely break the rules and start openly hunting down uh, the other princes and her abilities, all fascinating to me. Uh, the girl with, the girl that's all sunshine and hearts, Tyson, I think is her name. She's really interesting to me because she seems all sunshine and rainbows, but her ability to basically gain her followers' extreme loyalty and, uh, you know, if they read the Book of Tyson, if her Nen Beast of Hearts drops those little creatures on them and they have this, it seems to me like they have this servitude to her. And if they break the rules and there's this great punishment, it all looks really cutesy on the surface, but there's a lot of potential for once she's built a big enough following for her to show her true colors and turn conniving and cutthroat and what she's actually doing instead of spreading happiness and joy, you know, she's actually just building an army of servitude that she's then going to use to attempt to win the war. I don't know, I just have my eyes on her. There's a couple of other princes that have similar kind of powerful army building possibilities to them. Hockenberg has that huge aura when his followers come together, so there's a lot of potential power with him there. And the prince that died, the one that just chilled in bed with ladies the whole time, the arc was going on until he died. Um, he also had that Nen beast that emitted gas that made people like him, if I'm remembering correctly. So there are other princes that have Nen beasts that do something similar, creating a following around them. Uh, but I'm just saying, I've got my eyes on, on Tyson. I also have my eyes on Luzerus because he comes off as the most incompetent prince, but his Nen beast has the uh, the ability to show itself as what somebody wants really badly or the most and then entrap them after it's drawn them in which i don't know it feels like the nin beasts are supposed to be a reflection somewhat of the prince that it's supposed to be protecting right and i don't know it seems like these princes would want someone as seemingly useless as loserous so is his out outward appearance the way he's presenting himself a trap i've got my eyes on him i obviously also love the twins um I love their relationship. I love how sweet they seem to be. I think their Nen Beasts are incredibly cool. The little doorway thing I love. And of course, it was devastating when we lost one of them. But her sister doesn't even know. So I, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt when we get back to them. And whatever this Nen Beast is going to do as it's impersonating its person, and when the sister does eventually learn that her sister died all that time back, it's going to be really sad. Oh, and Mariam also interests me. Um, the little boy who, I think it's his beast that's doing this, is able to, he like created this miniature of his, miniature of his room, 
and people that try to enter his room, they enter into like an alternate dimension that looks exactly like his room, but they can't actually get to him. That's fascinating. I don't, plus his Nen Beast looks like a Triceratops. So I'm obviously going to love it. Anyway, those are some, uh, some plot points and some characters that really fascinate me. Speaking about my overall thoughts of this arc, which I've already done a little bit of, but I think that I, I really like this arc. I think that taking your main character and then just saying, maybe we'll get back to him, maybe we won't, let's go do something else. Bold move, Tagashi. And then building up this new arc as we're going to the Dark Continent. Let me tell you all about it. Let me tell you all these things. Making it sound so incredibly cool, getting your audience hyped for that, and then say, Maybe, maybe eventually. We're gonna do something else first that's definitively less interesting sounding. Bold move, Tagashi. And then the fact that it's such a text heavy arc and the fact that it's so wide. You have so many new characters and so many new plot points. The fact that it's, it's so intricate and there's so many things to keep track of and how much of a tangled web it is. So you really do have to keep up with this stuff. Otherwise, I imagine when things start, when everything starts falling, <laughs> when the war begins for real, um, it's going to, there's going to be a lot of little side things that were mentioned and not explored really deeply that's actually going to come back and be really interesting. So it's actually, it's an arc that you have to read every word, that you have to pay attention to every panel, that you have to really be trying to remember everything because it all seems like it's going to matter. It's a really ambitious arc. I think he's balancing it and juggling it quite well. It makes for a very slow moving setup, but again, we've already done a slow moving setup with the Chimera Ant arc and this whole arc seems to be doing that same kind of style as far as I can tell so far. And I think it's gonna end up with probably one of the coolest, most explosive, most devastating endings. Plus there's this really big emphasis on Nen after death in this arc, which was introduced in previous arcs, but there's been a lot of fake out deaths and resurrections. So we talked about Hisoka in the last video. And while I think that it was well done, made sense within the world, all the good things, it's still just not a trope that I like. And so I still kind of had a little bit mixed feelings on it. Now that I've read further on and I see that this is a theme that Togashi seems to be intentionally exploring and building on for a purpose, that makes me kind of recontextualize uh, the stuff that happened with Hisoka rather than saying, okay, yeah, you did it well, but I just, I don't love it. Now that I see what he's potentially doing with all this, that that was just the beginning of a lot of instances like that, that are building, I assume, to something bigger, I'm way more forgiving of it. I'm way less whiny about it. So like I said, we've been doing a lot of this. Um, the Hisoka one, obviously. Uh, Camilla with her resurrection ability. If she's killed, then the cat thing is activated and it steals the life force of someone else, puts it in her, and gives her another chance at life. That's another resurrection. Uh, the fourth prince, when we thought he was killed by his bodyguard, when we got the panel of her shooting him and him falling and he was shot in the head, it looked like he was dead, but then he wasn't. And that was the introduc introduction to his ability, which is a fake out death. And the twins, which doesn't cleanly fit into either of these definitions, these tropes that I'm talking about, but where uh, she, we thought she died and then she popped back and then it's revealed that it's actually her Nen Beast. Not really a fake out or a resurrection, but kind of in that same vein. Anyway, I, this isn't me listing things, listing my offenses. I think this is all great, actually. Now that I see that this is a pattern that he's intentionally doing so that he can build up to something, I assume I'm really excited about this because Togashi is putting a huge emphasis on Nen after death and not in the same way over and over again. He's from my perspective, the way I'm reading this is what he's doing is he's showing us a bunch of different scenarios. And I don't even know if I listed them all. There might have been more that I'm just not recollecting, but he's showing us a bunch of different scenarios of people who are either dying or would have died. 
and showing what Nen after death is capable of. Whether it's the will of being able to start your own heart and lungs back up, whether it's the Nen beast coming and impersonating you, whether it's your Nen ability sucking the life out of someone else and giving it to you. It's showing the different ways that Nen can save you or, or bring you back in, in, a, in some way, even just in theory as it impersonates you. He's showing all the different ways that Nen after death can be used as well as showing how Nen can protect you from death, whether it's from the fourth prince's Nen ability of being able to change the clock, change reality, uh, alter what direction things are going to take, or if it's the Nen beast, uh, catching a bullet before it can before it can go through your skull and I imagine there's a lot more. I remember there was one person who said let me show let me try out my ability or something like that and then he shot himself and we haven't heard from him again since then. But anyway, I'm sure we're gonna keep exploring this. I'm sure we're gonna keep seeing scenarios of how Nen is either saving someone or bringing them back or continuing to act on their behalf after their death. And because it's something that he keeps revisiting and keeps showing, not in the same way over and over again, but showing all the different ways that it can be done, it makes me think that he's, in this arc, he's building up to some big reveal that's going to happen during the war, during the action, when everything is at its peak, some sort of Nen after death something that he's been building up to is going to happen that's going to surpass everything that we've seen up to this point. So to me, I've gone from saying, ah, he did the trope well, but I don't like the trope, so kind of mixed feelings, to now saying, oh, that was the beginning of a lot of things that I think is building up to something really extraordinary. So I'm really excited to see what he's gonna do. I hope he doesn't drop this thread. I hope he doesn't you know, sub not subvert, just end on an anticlimax and not actually do anything with this. I mean, I know it's his style to end on an anticlimax with his arcs, but he still also makes them satisfying, like with the Chimera Ant arc. So, I'm really excited to see what he's gonna do because I really think that all of this is just a build up for something even bigger. And I think it's gonna be really, really cool. And I'm really excited about it. That probably should have been in the theories and not in the overall thoughts of the arc. Overall thoughts on the arc, I really like it. I think that it's very good. Um, it's not my favorite arc, that's still Chimera Ant, but I do think that it's very good. I think that he's doing a good job of this very slow build that's clearly leading up to this incredibly explosive tangled web where everything, all these little pieces are gonna come together in this really satisfying way. I'm excited to see what it's gonna be. I think that he's, I think that he's building up to something fantastic. It's not been the most exciting to read, up to this point, but it has been filled with tension and filled with opportunity, and I'm really excited to see where it goes. So, theories. <laughs> you already got my theory about how Nen After Death is going to be a massive part of this climax of what where we're going. I also originally had this theory that, you know, we have, which by the way, before I get too deep into theories, um, I just finished this. I've not I, I don't know, I don't know what the common theories are. So if I'm just gonna say stuff that's really obvious that everybody else has already speculated or if I'm gonna say something dumb that has already been disproven a dozen times, have mercy on me. But anyway, freshly having read this, not knowing what the common theories are, um, the, the gates to get into, uh, in, into the Dark Continent that apparently have a gatekeeper, naturally I'm looking forward at that and wondering, okay, so how do we get in? So the concession war isn't unique to the king. This is something that this kingdom used to do and he's now reenacted. But I do wonder if the reason he's doing it, well, my original theory was, is he doing it because right now he comes off as a very selfish, unloving, uncaring king. Uh, he has all these children and he frankly doesn't care who lives, who dies. He just wants the strongest. Doesn't make him look good. It would be interesting if he's this way with his family, specifically because of how strong his love is for his kingdom. And he knows that whatever he has to do to open the gates, maybe somehow he knows how to open the gates and he knows that whatever he has to do is going to kill him. So 
the reason he's doing this is because he loves his country so much that he wants to do anything that it takes to make sure that whoever succeeds him will be the most worthy. Um, so that was my original theory about why we're doing the concession war and what's going to happen and how we're gonna get into there. But now I have a counter theory because Net After Death is such a common theme here. I think that whoever, if, if somebody does have to die, to get into uh, the Dark Continent, to whatever they have to do to open the gates, if it would kill them, then I would think, especially if it's someone like the king or someone like whoever wins the war, I would think that they would have a strong enough will that their Nen After Death would be activated. So I think that whoever that is, it should be someone that we care about following. So it could be, either the fourth prince who's terrifying and him, whatever is going to happen will be terrifying that it happens. Or would it be Karapika? I mean, what if we have this whole succession war and instead of Togashi subverting everybody's expectations, fourth king wins, fourth prince wins, which I don't necessarily think is gonna happen because that's not really Togashi's style. It seems, I feel like something out of left field is going to happen or seemingly out of left field for where we are now, but because of all the buildup of different people who potentially can have a ton of power, uh, you know, moving forward after several more chapters, I think someone else is going to come and overpower him, but he's also been built up so well that he might still be a player once we get out into the Dark Continent. Anyway, what if he wins the succession war, it goes the way one might expect, but still explosively and awesomely, and then Karapika, says, oh, hey, you're the guy with the eyes, and Karapika kills him, and then he, oh, I forgot to say part of my theory, <laughs> and then it turns out that the reason the king was doing the succession war wasn't because he cares about his country, wasn't because he was looking for an heir, but was just because whoever wins this, he's gonna tell them to go open the gates so that they'll die, and he just wanted to make sure that the biggest and the baddest and the strongest would be the one to do it, uh, so that they could definitely get in. So then he says, well, all right, you're the winner. Go open those gates. So Karapika goes and opens those gates, Karapika dies, and then Karapika's Nen after death is activated because he finds out before he dies that the Phantom Troop is here and he has too strong of a will to still get vengeance on them. So his Nen After Death is activated to hunt down the spiders. And who knows, maybe the Nen After Death is going to like possess his body and use his body as the vessel to hunt them down. So Karapika isn't really himself anymore now. He's just this killing machine. Wouldn't that be an interesting full circle for his near corruption arc in uh, in York New and how much he's changed? I don't know. I think that would be kind of interesting. Either way, I really don't think that it's predictable. I don't think that there's any predicting how this is going to go because there's so many moving pieces and there's so many characters that have opportunity to become so strong that the war could genuinely go in any direction. And I think that that is really cool and is going to lead to some really, really awesome chapters eventually. I doubt that the chapters that we're getting here whenever they get published will, I imagine it's gonna be more build up. I doubt that we're going to really begin the war unless it's like the last chapter is the beginning of the war and then he goes on another hiatus, which he should take as many breaks as he needs for his health. But eventually when we do get there, I think it's gonna be amazing. Anyway, that's probably enough talking, don't you think? That's my last review on the chapters that have been released. I'll obviously chat about the new chapters whenever they do come out. I also later this month have a series review coming up where I'm going to talk about the series as a whole, strengths, weaknesses, my overall thoughts, all that good stuff. But until then, I would love to know what y'all think about this arc as a whole, as well as some of your main theories on what direction it's going to go in. I've really, really enjoyed reading the series so much, and I've really enjoyed chatting with the fandom as well in the comments. So please continue chatting with me. I post videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here, Tuesdays and Thursdays on the second channel. I will see you again soon. Bye.